Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is brought to you to the Focus on Fiction Radio Hour with Matt and Andrew. All right, people, clutch your pearls, grab your rosaries, and get ready to do a deep dive. We're going into quote-unquote Christian fiction today on Behind the Curve. like that phrase it's kind of like you know it sounds like it's it's a, it's a demographic it's not a genre but it's become a genre it, it, exactly it, it it's it's like writing it's like if you put like it's like if you put the wizard of oz and the grapes of wrath both under white fiction which yeah. see and no one would ever do that because that would be a stupid no. thing to do <laughs> but well, or there's no Muslim yeah. fiction. I'm pretty sure of that. No, there is. There is. I, I've, really? I've, I've, I've read some of it, actually. Oh, um, I mean, like... What? You mean, what, what, would you consider, like, um, Arabian Nights to be be that, or, or, or what? Or so probably just, like... I would I would consider the Arabian Nights Arabian fiction. Yeah. Um, but as to, sort of, like, is there, like, Muslim fiction in the way that we have Christian fiction? There definitely is. They're also, interestingly enough, because of the way that some Middle East countries are run, mm -hmm. that they actually have, like, censored versions in a very interesting way of, like, major, like, Disney, Universal, Warner Brothers films and, oh, like, yeah. books and everything. Yeah, like, it's kind of funny. It's, it's kind of sort of what we do with our fiction, not to get ahead of ourselves, but, like, it's it's kind of funny how, like, it's a, its own, like, sort of subgenre within, within the Middle East, certain parts of the Middle East. Oh, yeah, no, certain parts of the Middle East. We even have that in uh, the U.S. and Canada. We have we have things that are censored from other countries, usually uh, four East kids. Asia. Yeah, usually... usually four kids, yeah, four kids. <laughs> usually, usually, usually East Asian stuff, but yeah. Some of the stuff I kind of am glad it's... It's like, it's not for that one part. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, you know... You know, Europeans feel the same way about violence Americans do about boobs. It's just... Yeah. They kind of preserve, like, the, the artistic new thing that we lost in the Greco-Roman world. Yes! We're, whereas <laughs> we're like, hey, look, we're not saying violence is the answer, but violence is sometimes the answer. <laughs> Uh, I think it's because in animation, it's like you have more of a focus on like modeling, and there's animation more popular out in the east, and like you, a lot of times you had to draw like naked bodies, and that's kind of maybe not desensitize it, but like warms them up just that. I don't know, it's a theory. I can understand that because like if, if if you're exposed to something repeatedly, it loses its shock value, and to be perfectly honest, there's nothing really all that shocking about the artistic nudity of a human being. Yeah, of all the things that my generation's offended at, it, it, I usually do not find that something that I'd be offended of. But maybe that's because we, our media was so censored. I don't know. I, I, I don't have no idea. Okay, so uh, meanwhile, to drag this back on the path that started out with Muslim fiction and drifted over to censorship, and then somehow became about Canadians. Uh, but um, <laughs> Canada, wrong Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Vancouver, wrong Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> Seattle, where where X Files gets filmed. Where all the, everything gets filmed in Vancouver. That's true, though. That's true. Yeah. Um. Right. We're supposed to be talking about Christian fiction. I think our problem is that like, we well we've been trying to define it, but like I have some theories of like how it. Okay. Well, obviously, the elephant in the room is that I, I would think that it's it's not. It's just not good. Uh, I I would agree with you. So, did did modern, either... modern. after after nineteen sixty? So I anyway twentieth century twenty. So yeah, mid twentieth century. We'll 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 peg it there. So, what about? Do you have a do you have a definition of it? Ye okay, no, I think I think you're right. You're right. We should try and start with a definition. I just say that, like, ideally, it's just like it's for demographic for Christians, but like, at least in the West, it gets shaped a certain way. Like we said, like, oh, it's not a, it's not a genre, but it's become a genre. It it, it it's it's a genre. It, it 
it's a specific kind of writing that you wish to appeal to the religious sensibilities of your reading public yeah. above artistic considerations. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, that happens quite a lot with demographics. Oh, no, it, it, it does. And I think, you know, well, you know, as we've talked many times about fantasy, fantasy is very guilty of that, too. Especially with, like, uh, I, I think especially, like, in earlier fantasy, I would think their depiction of women trying trying to sort of appeal to a more of a male power fantasy. Conan. Conan. Yeah, no, Conan, for for all of, you know, the impact and artistic sort of legacy that it left, uh, Conan's depiction of women is, uh, oof, by modern standards. And for some weird reason, him and H.P. Lovecraft get get off, get off the hook, but for some reason, J.J. Keeley considers J.R.O. a Tolkien racist. Yeah, no, it was like, it's like yes, this is J.R.O. Tolkien who wrote scathing letters to to and about the Nazis and about <laughs> racism in general, uh, versus like I don't know H.P. Lovecraft, who was a you know a fuming racist, and you know uh, Robert E. Howard, who was also a racist and a and a uh, misogynist, or so, a sexist. But I know what you mean. I, I think yeah. the word misogynist should be a special word reserved for certain people. That that. That, that 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 is fair. That is fair. I I, th I think that that's one of those words that if you just that if you do throw it around, it, it it does lose the specific meaning that it actually does have. I mean, he was a a white guy who lived, grew up in Texas in the twenties, so it's it's not. I mean, I guess you could technically say he's more of a man of his time, but like the British thing, like he had a colonial past, but that's also another rabbit trail. But. I've seen J.J. Keeley try to argue this, and just, it's, I can't follow it. I really like love the man, but that's like one of the things that came up with. Yeah, no, I, I you, you tried to explain it to me one day, and I, 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 I couldn't, I couldn't roll with it. No. Uh, uh, he either derived his, his views from Michael Moorcock, from what I understand, like his uh, epic poo. Yeah, um, my, say. Mike, my, my, Michael Moorcock is somebody who. I don't know. It's like it's like the deeper I go into Michael Moorcock, I, I'll like gain a lot of respect for him, and then suddenly lose a ton of respect for him, and then gain other respect for him, and lose the respect for him as I go oh, in. That's how I've been with Alan Moore. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's like it's like oh wow, it's like oh wow, you wrote El you wrote Eldrick. Oh wow, you wrote Epic Poop. Oh wow, you wrote like all these epic accompaniments to Eldrick. You wrote a movie starring. You wrote. You wrote a like, jewel a terrible Jules Verne movie starring a Nazi submarine commander and Doug McClure. <laughs> that was pretty bad. <laughs> like, okay, all right, all right, Michael, all right. <laughs> okay, so again, we we have gone blazing off the beaten track again. Uh, but so well, we are here to talk about, uh. Christian fiction, and when we say Christian fiction, we mean specifically fiction that is directly targeted uh, at Christians as a demographic. Uh, maybe some examples I think would be useful. Like when I think of Christian, well, before that, oh, sure, go ahead. Uh, well, I was going to like segue into theories of why it not may not be good. Um, oh, sure, yeah, no, okay, yeah, go for so, it. My theories are these. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, my primary idea, and I'd love interaction with this, is just like because Christianity has always been a historic minority globally. Anyway, maybe like in certain wet centuries of the West, you could argue against that. I mean, like so sort of. Uh... I mean, actual saved people, like not so much like culturally. Culturally, yeah, you could say that there was a majoritarianness to medieval Europe. Yeah, medieval Europe. Anything before. Before secularism, I would say, because uh, because in the nineteenth century we started having, I, as much as atheism wasn't popular, we had actually a lot of spiritism in Europe. I don't know if you ever read yeah, about that. Yeah, no, no, spirit, people spiritism. People going to church and going to seances in the same week, like to me, that's messed up. Yeah, you know? no, especially during the Victorian era, there was a lot of uh, dabbling in sort of witchcraft and stuff, and uh, in, in in America, in, in America, there has always been. This is something that I think people do miss over a lot. In America, there has always been a, a pretty good streak of uh, deism or atheism or agnosticism, especially. I think in America, is has always been. 
even like even among the founders, there was a, there was a strong flavor of agnosticism deism. and deism. Yeah, which, I mean, I definitely I mean, think that like, they're they're, it's they're the kind of thing, I think. Yeah, it's it's the it's the individualism. It's the uh, it's the yes, I will apply John Locke's view of self on the cosmic scale, which it wasn't intended to be applied that way, but. <laughs> It was intended to deal with, hey, this is my land. <laughs> I can grow how many apples I want on it. I can grow the apples I want. I can sell the sheep I want. And the king don't own it. I own it. Capitalism, True. ladies and gentlemen. But, yeah, um... Yeah, but, but, like, I would say that since there's always been, like, a minority of... At least now... Let's just say, because like I feel like secularism has caused people to not want to identify, especially more and more like with a Christianity, unless they absolutely have to on a cultural level. So because of that, that we've always been a minority. That means by and large we produce less plumbers, also less writers. Um, yeah, no, I, it, it's from like yeah no for like within the jit with like in in the genuine like practicing church community i mean like one that is not just being practiced for example like from the control of like say you know oh yes the catholic the, yes the holy see is also our local government or like in like the american south or like latin america where like religion in general is like kind of a, a formal um nominalist thing it's, in a way it's inescapable it's an inescapable Yeah, yeah, part it's of like society. you kind of like work within it no matter what. Yeah. That's right. not what I mean. It's it's the difference between the social gospel and the gospel gospel. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. Which which, which is, you know, a uh, genuine diff but no, I I, th I think you're definitely onto something. So say saying that the that the true gospel has been a minority even within the historical practice of the church, even in something that we would call historically Christian na like Western Europe. Yeah, no, that I I th I think that's fair to say that 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 group of truly practicing people has always been a minority. I, I... but I think because of that, like you get less Christian writers in the world at large, including like even like something benign, like like plumbers or something, because they're just coming from a smaller people group. Yes, uh, I I would I would I would have to generally agree with that. Yes. So. That Oh, go That's ahead. That's my primary opinion, but, like, um, did you want to have someone where your one of your theories? Well, so, to, to come from that perspective, I, I was thinking that um, the fact that we have a cultural sort of relationship with, um, I think in the West, especially, we have a, we have a cultural relationship with uh, Christianity, but not necessarily a spiritual one. Um, I, th I think the fact that I think that makes it, I think that means that the themes appear a lot more in literature. But that also gives more opportunity for the themes to, to be distorted or interpreted differently, to so, be deconstructed. Which is kind of weird because, it, yeah. like in a way, like our culture takes something like redemption and like kind of either does it better than we took it, even though that's a Christian concept, at least the way that it's been sold in the West, yes. or just deconstructed. <laughs> Or, e or even, I mean, you know, uh, consider the, co the concept of a, of a Jeremiah. Consider even just, you know, what, what is the most widely read Eastern book in Western civilization? It's the Bible. Uh, so, uh, you know, even, you know, elements of Eastern storytelling, near, near Eastern storytelling, I should say rather, or mythology... That was adopted from there, or even the la kind of language that we use in the West is all very much sort of uh, based around at, at least sort of the the connection, the widespread nature of the Bible in the West. Yeah, and just like uh, other weird things like good and evil. Like I know there's like other like Zoroastrianism, Judaism, and Islam. Like that's at least like the the Middle Eastern influence on the West, which is pretty interesting. Like yeah. that was a big thing in the '80s, but now now less so. Yeah, no. Among sort of the cultures that were there before, there, there wasn't really that kind of 
I don't want to say. I don't want to say like the the Quran and the Bible like made all this big deal like oh we wiped out this pagan nation that pagan nation or Muhammad got rid of like this thing from Me all the idols from Mecca and stuff like that. Right, and like the other like sort of cultures that were sort of I mean like pre-Roman, like pre-Roman Europe, uh, all the things in the New World. There really wasn't that concept of evil and good. It, like, I mean, there there are, you know, with, within sort of a cosmic sense, there was, of, like, there being good and bad. But there really yeah. wasn't that sort of, I mean, I, I would say that, you know, even of those, you know, four religions, that, that they have very different understandings of what good and evil are. Of course, yeah, they're not interchangeable. But, like, I think it's also interesting that, like, a great book to read about this is called The Gifts of the Jews, of how, like, a lot of... A lot of other like cultures like evil and good are kind of intertwined like shiva god destroyer and creator like seeing that side of the same force the yin and, and the yang things... the good and the evil and the evil and the good yeah or like things were seen as sort of like as a cycle like uh, like reincarnation or just cycle of the universe which is another thing in hinduism but like viking you had, like, an, an end to history mm -hmm. with 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 christianity you had revelation and you were literally told the end from the beginning as, it... as like prophecy this idea of, of prophecy like you know, like the the God test from um, what it, what was it? Uh, Bal Ezekiel or whatever. Uh, a linear world versus a circular one. Yeah, basically. So, sort of all of these things. I mean, possibly the only the only exception that I'm aware of to the linear world history would be um, the Norsemen. The, no the Norse, because the, the Norse had a beginning, had a clear beginning and end to the universe. But other than that, I can't, I can't think of any society that wasn't in some way cyclical. Either that or their records were lost. I don't know, it's a possibility. Oh, heavens. That's, that's another rabbit trail that you don't want to get down, is the, what was in the records that this civilization lost? We don't know. But that, that is a good point. Um, I think yes, the West and has been integrated with Christian ideas, and that Jew, Jewish and Christian ideas are very unique to the point where we can't understand that. But like, since there is like a certain church that does certain things, mm -hmm. that my idea was that it doesn't make sense that how we have all this free. Christians always have the duty of saving souls, getting justified. I mean, getting sanctified. But now we have all this free time, and it seems like people are taking that to either binge watch or create great new fiction. But that doesn't apply to us. Like, you know, you know mm. what I'm saying. Like, you think that would actually create more of an opportunity for us to create create fiction, but we really haven't latched onto that. You you would think so, and you know, th this would go to you know sort of the uh, um, C.S. Lewis's. You know, it, you know, you 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 don't just you know the, the the rescuers don't just stand on the beach all day yelling, waiting to see if anybody needs to be rescued. It's you know, you go about your lives rescuing people. So, and I, I do agree with you. I, I, I don't know why there's been, even if anything, a, a continued souring of um, Christian fiction. And this is not the everything used to be better Dagnabbit rant. <laughs> I promise I won't even say Dagnabbit once. <laughs> uh, but so, to take... Uh, well, you know, let, let's actually finish your first sort of section so we can move from sort of general into specifics. So, like, it's like I think we should use the rest of your first point as like a funnel to get us into the more specific topics. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, you were saying that like. Um, that when you know a contemporary era with so much free time and access, it's relatively. Yep, you yeah, know, cheap media, cheap access to media. Why is most Christian media so bad? So my my theory is that you're not trying to make art. Is my is is much of my main theory is you're not concerned about the art of it. You are concerned about it being used. I think it's hard to say. But like from a, lo a lot of the a lot of writers who I see are like, I wrote a Christian story. 
and I'm afraid that it's not Christian enough. <laughs> not it's not good enough. Not it's not good enough. Is it Christian enough? Which is... It's not quite the same thing as, like, I wanted to be theologically correct, either. Precisely. Yes. Do I want... Do I want... It, I, I hope all of your novels are theologically correct. I hope... I expect every Christian novel to be theologically correct. You know, it, it, it's, you know it's like, Ah, oh, yes, this is by... Uh, this is my cop drama where the our main protagonist decides that he's going to become a hard-boiled Marcian. He believes that the Old Testament was a lie. But will his past catch up to him south of the border? We need to write this. <laughs> Marcionism. Marcionism. But I think it might be a consumer... Like, the Babylon Bee podcast actually brought this up, but, like, mm -hmm. it could be, like, a consumer drive because there's, like, a market for, like, Christian parents to give kids stuff to their kids that's, like, the Christianized clean version. Yes, and there is. Yeah. And, and that's part of what I hate, is the Christianized clean version. Have you ever read the Bible? <laughs> there is nothing clean about the Bible. But we do sell kids' version of the Bibles that they take that stuff Yes, out, which yes. Which is also its own market. Oh, my word. See, I... Once you censor the Bible, that's... No. That's... No. Like, it was meant to... It was... Every word was meant to be there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So... Yeah. So... How I would say, how I would respond to that is, no, you do not need to like. Do, do you need to tone some things down for little kids? Yeah, yeah, of yeah. course, of course you do. You know, but do you need to sanitize things for a Christian audience? No, because not only does that defy reality. I'm sorry, terrible things happen in reality. That's 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 part of being a. Christian is realizing that yes, terrible things that don't make sense to us happen in reality, and that and that's the and that's part of living in an imperfect world. That's part of living in a fallen world, and only ever having sort of the Saturday morning version of it in in literature, you know, having it presented as somewhat childish and simplistic. We're having it, you know, represented along such, you know, just clean-cut lines. You're, you're, you're losing out because life isn't like that, nor is the Bible like that. The Bible is full of horrible things. It is full of decapitations and murder and stealing and persecution and rape and blood and guts and nasty terrible things that no self-respecting Christian author is ever going to put in their Christian novel. But I did think of, you know, I, I think it might be the fact that just how rare death is now, especially like with all this medical technology and how it's like true. like how the suburbs are, like if, you're, if your neighbor dies like you won't know it, but also like I think you like this as someone who kind of likes maybe not so much high church stuff, but like uh, proper biblical ecclesiology, that like this Identify this idea of Sunday school and not having an integrated church and abandoning the concept of um, childhood cat catechumism. Cat no, I'm trying to say cat catechesis. Catechesis, yeah, has like kind of divided the church in an artificial way that has that's not biblical. Like I know a lot of Reformed Baptists, which is I, I would say that the the, the one. Um, the one denomination I, I, I identify most with like has a lot of integrated churches where the, there's no Sunday school that the children are with the parents in during the sermon yeah no uh, the, the churches that I've always gone to have always been that way and I think that's important because I mean part part of the promise of of you know the sacrament is that y yes he comes through word and sacrament and if you're and if you are apart from both of those things like in Sunday school I mean yeah albeit you could be getting the word but are, are you getting you know the full experience are, are, are you being part you're not being a full part of the church as you should be expected to be um and it's funny though because as much as we might not agree with sacrament agree with on the point of sacramentalism like a lot of Christians don't know about like the idea of the gift of preaching like that's that's a gift for today. 
Like I mean, like maybe some Pentecostals talk about it more because it's like kind of woot, woot. pneumatic. You know, it's, it's, it has to do with the Holy Spirit, but like it's it's something maybe a lot of people don't think about. Shout out to our Pentecostal viewers. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go get you some tambourines once we back up the truck. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's been a long day. Uh, so, um, eventually, I guess this is all kind of just narrowing down to the big question, which is, why is Christian media so bad? So you asked it as, why is Christian media so so bad? And I wrote it in my bullet-pointed notes is, why is everything so dang cringy? <laughs> so... So, I don't know, do you want to answer that now, or do you want to actually save that towards the end and work through some of our other points first? I think uh, the, it all boils down to this. It goes back to children as well. It's mm -hmm. just ignorance. And I think this is how yeah. Christian education was done. Like, obviously, in the U.S. and the EU, um, it's hard to blame Christian schools to, to even exist because, like, you're, uh, you're honestly fighting something that is given for free, your taxpayer money. You, you, you are, you are, and... Because, like, here's something that, you know, we have to say, you know, mad, mad respect for people who work in schools. Schools are expensive. Mm. Schools are expensive to run, and they don't necessarily offer a ton for their employees. It's, it, it's a it's, labor of love. It, 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 it really, really is. It's, it's not like... Uh, it's, it's not like the medical field, at least in America... In the medical yeah. field, where you can say, "We're, we're going to aggressively go after the best people," yeah, because you know, and the best people want to come here, you know, because the best people, you know, they they, they do get, you know, the, they they get, you know, better than average salaries in general. They get better than you know, but in education, I mean, below like the high college level private public it's just, it, you really don't have much of that i'm sorry I, I i got off topic a little bit no it's a good point because like i i think and, and most christian parents like who, who don't even have any sort of like, like bad intention and, and want to really expose their kids to the real world to some degree to yeah. more than homeschooling not that homeschooling is a type of shield sometimes it is but like certainly can most be. of them are doing that so they cannot get involved in drug culture like i think that's why places like calvary chapel I mean, Cal Calvary Chapel Ch uh, Church School probably exists, was able to exist in Northeast Philadelphia for as long as it has, because like it just, it's just a better option for a lot of these kids, especially for those who go, probably to, to church already and are able to like grow for deals to make it cheaper for them to to attend, who, who know their situation on a personal day to day level. Yeah, no, that that's how because at least where we're from, there are uh, a lot of Christian schools. I mean, particularly, I, I would say. Yeah. private catholic schools is i mean yeah you can't you, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a private catholic school in, in our neighborhood but the thing is like they, they take but my point was like they take mm -hmm. them out of public schools not so they can get a good education even theologically necessary just to take them out of of a bad culture so like the education they get might just be not because anyone's bad or not doing their job but subpar, and it's not certainly not going to be translated to you one know, of the great things that you had to know to great fiction, psychology, history, philosophy, that, that sort of thing. Yeah, no, it, it, it is to give people a better transition, and also, I mean, to, to, to get away from what is, even in, I mean, where, where we, even where we come from, I, mean, I would think that, you know, we have been fairly well blessed to come from a pretty decent area. Uh, even, even, you know, even the schools up here aren't great in you know you know and we live in the northeast like it's like the most built up part of, of america yeah we, we we live in one of the more built up wealthier parts of america and even in our public school they they they, they ain't great so but so th there's this struggling system but the alternative is very very expensive and it's also hard to access especially when you're having it you know put up against something that's free and you're gonna pay for it whether you use it or not and there's also the question oh what about christian colleges well i'm sure a lot it teach some great theology i'm a great christian college now that does pretty well even though i don't i'm not taking anything like fiction or theology anymore mm -hmm. with it but um and it does teach you know the things that are going to not be taught in uh elementary uh public school or of any type or a 
private Christian school of that matter. But from what I understand, a lot of seminaries and Christian schools get like progressively liberal, especially as they acquire like government money and they basically have to listen to what they do to keep their Pell grants and whatnot. Even if they don't agree with it, they just gotta like and that makes them liberal. Like, you know, you need theological seminary, right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh my they were old conservative. advisor teaches my old advisor teaches there. Yeah. Yeah, they were they were fairly conservative, but now and also the fact that they're in the middle of Manhattan have really they're like the most leftist out there call it Christian college in the world, basically. Uh, I, I, I mean, yeah, no, you, you do see, and even this is, and this is, I, I don't think this is just, you know, talking about like liberal as a political, this is talking about liberal as a measure of orthodoxy. Yes. Would you yes. Say? Yeah. So but it's, it goes in hand in hand with politics sometimes, but yeah. yes, yes, it, it, it does in some cases, but I, I'd say, I'd say, yeah, that the, the, the slide towards theological non-orthodoxy uh, is something that I think seems to progressively set in, especially in a long-standing institution. Because I think I think that in some point that some at some points I think especially in an institution you have to kind of make the choice between success or ethics at some points. Yeah. And it's like, oh, do we stay true to ourselves? So did I just call most of the big colleges in America sellouts? Uh, I guess I did. <laughs> <laughs> well. Most take the Pell Grant. That's no, that's the thing. And I mean, you gotta listen to the government. I right, and I mean, then again, also if you're a college, what are you gonna do? Not take the grant that lets you stay in business? It's only a matter of time. I hate to say it. Yeah, no. I mean, also running a co I know people will complain about like, oh, the cost of college. Oh, the cost of you know, tuition. Tuition. The cost of room and, and yes, it is steep, but also. Very few colleges are profitable, let alone make a lot of money. I mean, it's just education is just not a profitable field. It's an important field. It's just not that profitable. And, it's, and colleges it, usually they, they where the best salaries come from anyway. Yeah, and it, they are our best hope, but they're not a good hope. I'll, I'll say that. Yeah, no, I, I get I get behind that. I would, I would get I would get behind that. It's yeah no. I, I went to a very small Christian school and um, who did not take the Pell Grant, but um, yeah, no, like like, but there's a reason it's a very very small school. You know, and it's money can be an adventure there. <laughs> I, I I understand, but yes, yes, money money can definitely be an adventure. Uh. But so, to 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 move to move on, and I think this is interesting what you're talking about is that one thing that you do get with a private college is even if they do take Pell grants, is you do get education of the classics. Yes, yes, and usually, the, and the classics you get some kind of something. Yeah, and and the classics are going to be, and yes, I I know they may be probably less popular now than ever. But there's a reason why you ought to read the classics because they give you the foundation of everything as we understand it. And I think that leads us in to examples of Christian media and what exactly we're talking about here. Because I, like, I feel like we've been talking at this sort of a very high academic level. We haven't really been talking, like, we've been talking like about, you know, causal things. We haven't actually talked about, like, any, like, you know, concrete physical things. But so... Uh, I think we're gonna dive into the the borrowing from secular media, the Christian education, and yeah, I think that's the reason the way that this is interconnected with that is that like you need to know fiction to write it. Like yes. you, you need to know what to borrow because sometimes a lot of Christian fiction like kind of copies off of stuff by accident without knowing it. Like or or they're just not interested in it in it to be in, in general. To know what's good out there and, and fiction is worth making like would you know that fantasy is worthwhile if you hadn't read red wall or lord of the rings uh no i i, I i'm not sure i would have i mean like w w like w would you have known you know something something science fiction my brain just went blank but like i mean stellar <laughs> i don't know sure i mean like but like Comparatively, so 
sort of looking within that so I think you mentioned like earlier about the difference between being a shelter of like like of like you know sort of using the home as a shelter versus using the home as kind of a, of a protection because mm-hmm. I mean I you know <sighs> all right let's let, let, me, let me try and sort of bring this back around so like we were talking about sort of like specific examples so I think something that we could try and do with that and borrowing for me it's like Kind of, like, kind of talk about what we consider to be Christian literature, like, like what we consider to be Christian with a quotation marks, with a with a quotation marks literature. Like, like the first thing I kind of think of is I kind of think of like I think of like Left Behind. I think of Bible Man. I think of the Veggie thing, Tales. Veggie Tales. Yeah, see, that's a real purpose, our uh, real destiny in life to make sure that uh, Christian media comes up with something better than. Veggie Tales before Christ returns. Veggie Tales is still the Ve- Veggie Tales is the crowning achievement of late twentieth century Christian media. How does that make you feel? <laughs> hey, they predicted meme culture. That's true. A lot of Monty. They did parodies extremely well. They did. They, they, they... Yeah. Um, Bible Man. Did you ever watch Bible Man? Yes. Oh. That... I thought it was made in the 90s, but I think it was made in the 2000s. Believe it or not, <laughs> that was in fact made in the 2000s. Um, let's see what else. McGee and Me was a, was a little bit of a cut above. A little bit of a cut above. Mm, yeah. Not... Adventures in Odyssey, that was very good, actually. That seemed to really know what it was doing. I, 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 have, heard, I have heard many good things. I, I, I never got into the series myself, but it does have a... It does have a lasting impact on many of the people who who uh, achieved it, uh, and I will say, focus on the family radio theater. They did some excellent work. They they they, they did some excellent audio dramas, and and I think I think part of why that they were excellent is they did not just stick to like safe Christian stuff. Is that they did is is you know. Th- I can't believe I'm saying about focus on the family, but they actually they actually took a leap. They did you know stories. They they actually did a series that was about murder and demons and like spooky stuff that we're afraid to I talk think I about. Listen to that before. What was it called again? Um, Father something. It's it's not Father whatever from G.K. Chester. Not Father Brown. Uh, also, Father Brown, you should read those. That's beside the point. The, like, they're they're not earth shattering, but they are fascinating. Um, except like the, the last one that he wrote was really really good. Um, but I don't recall. I don't recall. But it was actually it was actually some very good, some very very good radio theater there. I think objectively good. And it held. They also did a Diedrich Bonhoeffer thing, which I, I tried to listen to, but I couldn't. I, I'd listen to it again. That was. It was good. That, yeah. That's that that was actually a very good one. I have listened to that. Yeah. Uh so to, to, so so now as you can see, we we we've kinda hit on what we think, you know, to be uh Christian media no like and or like I'm thinking like Christian movies or Christian movies. For the record, at least they've tried to be better. <laughs> God bless their hearts. Uh, like, okay, there, there were some good ones, there were some bad ones. But, um... I think it's because a lot of, like, Christian filmmakers are from the South, and they're, like, outside of Atlanta, which they probably don't have a lot of good access to. Like, there's really no good production capabilities, and there's no... There's not a lot of writers in the South enough to, like... Like, the Kendrick Brothers, you know, like... Unless you live in Charlotte, you're not going to have, like, the, be in the cutting edge of, like... We, like, we live... Again, this is, like, a north-south thing. Like, we live outside of Philadelphia. Like, if there's something new, you, like, know about it, you know? Yeah, we, we, we get it first. Whereas, like, I mean, what cities in the south are on, like, the bleeding edge? Atlanta, Dallas, Houston, that's about it. Austin, maybe? Austin maybe Miami, too. too. There's more of a Latino thing down there. So, Miami. they might be a little bit more disconnected from American white culture miami honestly. does its own dang thing as far as i can tell like i don't know my, my, so maybe miami they're, they're inside more. 
Miami thinks it's still the 80s. <laughs> That's true, though. I bet you if the Dolphins won the Super Bowl, three quarters of the city wouldn't even notice. <laughs> if the Marlins stadium blew up tomorrow, everybody would go, didn't there used to be a Walmart there? <laughs> That's probably why they used the Super Bowl, uh, had held Super Bowl there this year because no one was using it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they finally moved the, the, our favorite sculpture, nude tuna descending a staircase. <laughs> oh, this is so off the topic. Um, so, um, one of the things I think that we have to talk about is sort of. Uh, that Christian literature dividing from things that we would describe as as literature with Christian overtones, because um, I think of you know we look at classically Christian writers from the first half or the middle of the twentieth century, we have some people who have some legitimately serious um, literary uh, street cred. Oh yeah. Yeah. So you so you have C. S. Lewis, Tolkien, Dorothy Sayers. Uh, I never read her. Yeah, uh, she's actually quite good. Dorothy, Dorothy Sayers, uh, G.K. Chesterton, and uh, from America you have Flannery O'Connor primarily. So, um, again, all these authors were uh, very devoutly, um, excuse me, uh, religious, but they but none of them wrote what we would call Christian literature. Lewis and Tolkien are both always put under fantasy rather than religious. Dorothy Sayers and G.K. Chesterton wrote, um... They wrote everything. Mysteries or drama. Actually, they both wrote everything. And Flannery O'Connor wrote... Putting that woman in a genre is like trying to, you know, catch soup with a sandwich. <laughs> uh, she... Uh, Let's just go. Let's just go with Southern Gothic. Okay, fair. So simply a subgenre. Yes, all of them are religious, but all of them were all of them wrote literature with strong Christian overtones. But they also have a very high level of respect beyond the Christian reading public. For example, uh, you know Flannery O'Connor is considered you know among graduate school classes, she's considered one of the American masters of short fiction. She and, uh, like, North American short fiction. Like, she, Alice Munro, uh, or there's some of the female authors who are considered to be, you know, masters of their genres. And then, so you think about that, and Alice Munro was very much not a Christian author, but that is beside the point. Uh, but so... It went from be so from that. That is what we had as sort of our. That was sort of the legacy going into the second half, and then how does you know Christians writing literature? How does that become a more or less? It's become a meme, and I find it very interesting. Also, I saw a uh, I saw a doctoral presentation by a lady who um, studied. Lewis. I, I don't recall her name. She wrote a book about him. It was an interesting book. I can't remember the name of it. Um, it was a good presentation. You're going to say, and they're saying that how much sort of like uh, the kind of Christianity that we were, they were talking about, you know, clutching the pearls and, you know, shielding the home and we got to turn it down. How those people all kind of got, you know, to use our modern vocabulary, got put on blast by so many of these writers. Uh, you know, uh, C.S. Lewis, you know, was... And C.S. Lewis blasted these people. Uh, Tolkien took on a lot of people like that. Uh, Dorothy Sayers once said that the, church is that the church is asleep and then they were fools. Uh, she, she said that to a church... Uh, Flannery O'Connor once said that her audience... Flannery O'Connor, who was a very devout Christian, she also had a very colorful manner of stringing words together, uh, but she said something uh, comparing um, her... Uh, you know, basically saying her audience had no idea what she was talking about when she'd bring up some great Christian thinker. And she would say she, no. you know, she would make some allusion to St. Augustine and they'd stare at her like she lost her mind. And she said this happened in every church that she ever spoke at. And so, like, 
So they were all very sharp criticisms of Christian culture. Uh, Flannery O'Connor wrote a whole story about how gullible Christians can be just because something else, something presents itself as Christian. Uh, it, it, uh, another thing I could think of that it, it is, I do think there's a legitimate anti-intellectual um, thing in the church that it's hard to pin down, at least in the mm -hmm. West. But I think that the fact that secularization is so rampant and we're the, some of the last people to believe in supernatural stuff. Mm -hmm. Kind of makes us maybe more accept, uh, susceptible to like belief in general to being like kind of like fooled. Yeah, no, that's true. It is is I think there is sort of that genuine hope of saying, oh well, maybe this one's right. Hey, but like, hey, it ain't great, but we at least have this. We're like Sonic fans clinging on to that one good game. <laughs> no, I think. What was that? The glory, the glory days syndrome. Yeah, it is it's the glory days. Uh, how many of the glory days we really don't know about? Because like, how many people you think have read uh, the man who was Thursday? In general, in general, uh, probably fewer than have recommended it on an online for on an online forum. Yeah, I I myself I haven't actually read it. I I mean I I studied passages from it in college, but I never actually read the whole thing. Um. For me, I kind of see that anti-intellectualism in, I, I, I would say, you know, things that have more of a puritanical streak in them, or, or, or sort of, I, I don't want to use this prerogative, I don't want to use this universally, but I would say low church Protestantism, and, and I don't want to say that in like, oh, well, you know, the further you get from Catholic, the closer you get to Satan. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that... I know that. Yeah, but, the, but there is sort of a say in, in sort of, I would say in like, I would say the primitive movements, the, the fundamentalist movements, which I would argue that the fundamentalist movements really aren't fundamental at all. They're actually getting away from the fundamental orthodoxies. But... I, I would say that's where I kind of see the anti-intellectual streak is in in fundamentalism, and these are the same kind of people who are going to argue that like, well, you know, if you let your children read, uh, you know, fantasy things, they will grow up to be Satan worshippers, and you all go to hell. <laughs> I think maybe something subtle that um came out of that that was there was sort of this Christian antinomianism, I mean, not antinomian, oh, um, <laughs> Christian ant. Anico anaconianism that has come out since the Reformation that like um, sort of a fear of, of, of images that came out like from certain sort of abuses of, of praying to the saints oh that it, sort of the, that even in art done by Protestants that there was like just a big focus on landscape paintings I think I almost want to say that's why it caught up in Europe because it's like there was this big movement from Protestant writers and I mean artists to, to, to make that sort of thing I iconoclasm yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I, uh, yeah, no, I, I think that is a that is a huge root of it. Is is the uh, iconoclasm? It is a root of that, and I mean, to uh, sort 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 of to sort of quote Flannery O'Connor. What was it? She said, "If if 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 the symbol has a meaning, then why do you want to get rid of it? And if the symbol has no meaning, then the hell with it. Why did you want it in the first place? So if it has a meaning, why do you want to get rid of it? If it doesn't have a meaning, then why did you have it ever to begin with?" So I think there's also this guilt by association. I don't mean to interrupt you, but oh, like, go for it. That like, yeah, like when when you like sort of are like t things consider certain things as dirty. You're not gonna like try to eat the chicken and spit out the bones. Like a lot of my stuff is um, taken from Shane Carruth, mm -hmm. the Wachowskis. Uh, Shane Carruth is uh, a sex offender, and the Wachowskis are self-proclaimed transgender leftists, possibly New Agers. And I'm okay with that, That and I still love their fiction. If the Wachowskis were Muslim, I would still read their fiction. But mo a lot of Christians could not do that, and they could most certainly not take the fiction and, and learn from it. Uh, I, I learned this by going through a class on uh, is Islamic sociology. Um, just watching... sort of watching uh, a class full of Christians try to comprehend the world like world history told from an eastern from like from like a near eastern perspective like from a perspective of like oh like you know 
oh, you know, you have Charlemagne? We have the early caliphate. You know, like... Yeah. Like, if you think about that, it's like... It's like, but people are, like, kind of freaked out by it. It's like... Or, like, or like reading Salman Rushdie or reading Asian literature at, at the really small school that I went to. It's like, oh, yeah, we're, we're gonna we're gonna dig into, you know... Oh, hey, everybody, we're gonna learn how Taoists think. And, and pe- pe- people seem to get, you know, wigged out by it. It's like, oh my goodness, even if we're approaching this, well, why would we need to do that? Even, even like, you get some reports of people saying, like, well, why would my child need to learn that? Why would my child need to care what a Taoist thinks? And, I, and, and I'm saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm sure the Taoists are saying, yeah, why do I need to care what a Baptist thinks? <laughs> But it's kind of funny, like, it's kind of more disturbing that this is happening in, like, a place like suburban Philadelphia, because, like, like it's, like, how, you are how close to, like, Chinatown and stuff? Like, it's just kind of, it never happened to me, and I don't know why, despite being a homeschooler, because I'm curious or something, but I don't know. Like, 10% of, I went to a, I went to a small art school, but, uh, like, a large population of, a large group of our population was, it, like, is... Asian, not just like of Asian descent. I mean, like actually, like they came directly from either you know China or uh, I almost said North Korea, South Korea, to study at my school. And, and my school was an art school, so you would kind of expect that people would be a little bit more, yeah, you know, like saying like, oh, why, why, why would we study this here? It's like. These are the people, like, this is the history of the people who are in the room next to you. Like, and you, <laughs> it's so you, practical. yeah, you, you, don't, you don't even, add, and it's like, I actually had listened to one of my professors talk about the battle that she had to go through to even get uh, African literature on the curriculum. And it's like, people were saying, well, why would we care? Like, like why should we make our people study this? It's like, because it matters. This is yeah, like, like you might just like it too. It, 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 even <laughs> even even if you don't like it, I mean, you could learn just whole other perspectives and things. So I think that you're definitely onto something. A fear of other perspectives. It's almost like the if we present something else, it, it's it's not, something not a fear. It's if we present something else, people might think it's better than us. It's a Christian safe space. It's an echo chamber. Exactly. Exactly. That's the issue. Real life is not an echo chamber, kids. <laughs> so I think this kind of comes up to a wrap up of how will we be different. I think one of the reasons is that we're we're, we're northeasterners, we're, we're we're Philadelphians. You know, like we we know like Philadelphia is the second biggest uh, city on the East Coast, only after New York. Even though Washington is getting up there, but by greater area anyway. Mm-hmm. But like, yeah, like we're forced to deal with just not just um different ideas, but with bad ideas, like hostile ideas. We're forced to to deal with hostility that like like your your wasp baptist in in kentucky is going to deal with no offense to wasp baptist in kentucky yeah something about the hilltoppers something positive about the hilltoppers something positive about the hilltoppers <laughs> something something college football <laughs> mint juleps <laughs> sorry horse racing is cool too horse, horse racing is cool don't whip the ponies give the ponies sugar <laughs> We like ponies here. <laughs> <laughs> Me especially. Uh, uh, all right. So yes. How? Okay. So. Uh, Blurka Dirk. Uh, do you... I was gonna say that like um educate since we also talk about education like mm-hmm. we are both homeschoolers. I don't know if yes. the audience knows that, but you were classically educated. And can you like talk about like kind of what that is? Sure. Uh, so, uh, a classical education is an educational theory, which kind of it, it it it's a very Western, very old European style of teaching, which is essentially you would start, um, you would start from a very young age. You would start trying to expose uh, a child to the classical, like, Greco-Roman arts. So those would be, like, language, history, and reasoning. So you would kind of build everything else off of those things. You, you, so you would kind of expect the person to, you know, be able to have a high historical, a high literary, and a high 
ability to communicate in society and and people with this background often go into either like law or politics um which is interesting because it does have it does have a focus on specifically history and the arts which is honestly which is i think a pretty fitting focus for me but you can also like specialize to something different even go to trade school or university when when you're done with it yeah you can because because it 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 is something that values, I think, practicality. I I think, but it also kind of tends to favor like character. Yeah, um, character development. Character development, I think, is is a major part of it. And albeit, you know, it, it's it doesn't handle things all the best. I am still clueless with things like like I I've never been I was never great at physical science. I still, I still was not because that was that was always kind of you know one of the lower priority things, but the fact that you know you have so much focus on uh, culture and learning and developing an actual genuine sort of affection and understanding of the world as it was and the world as it is, I mean, I, I it's it's. It's I, I I think it's a very nice cultural philosophy. I think it's a very nice educational philosophy. It definitely does not work for everybody, but it it has been used for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So, if it if it sounds like something that you know could benefit you or someone you know or someone you educate, go for it. it it's it's definitely one way of learning. It also promotes people to be self starters. Yeah, and I think that's what kind of segues good in my point. Like, I think self-education when it comes to fiction is important. I mm -hmm. challenge myself to create top ten lists for movies and and TV shows and books and stuff. And like, I also know JG Keeley, and that's got he's got give me not only a new he not only gave me a new standard for fiction, but he showed me a lot of great great works. And and mm -hmm. I gave them to you by osmosis <laughs> at the very least. Yes, from all the top ten lists you leave under my pillow, and I absorb while I sleep. <laughs> no, well, me metaphorically across the internet, but no, I, I think you're right, and that, that's something that even we learn. I think we learn that even in the Bible. You know, the Bible. You know, if 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 you are taking in bad things, you're going to put out bad things. If you're taking in good things, you're going to put out good things. So if if you're taking in junk art, you're going to produce junk art. And I think ultimately the reason why we will be different is because we're trying different ideas in general that I feel, and this really excites me, that I feel like fiction at large maybe is not has not thought of yet or hasn't been popularized yet. Like, what if someone were to make a novel ideas about anthropomorphic animals or what comes after postmodernism, what comes after cyberpunk and, and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why? Why not? innovate dream like the history of christianity is filled with innovators and dreamers and thinkers and people who challenged things galileo was a devout christian he challenged what everybody in the church thought you know uh louis pasteur changed how we drink milk which sounds like a, not quite a big a deal as it really is <laughs> it saved lives that's yeah, all you gotta yeah, know yeah no like the, the, you know as, as much as people will probably... Some people will not like this. Jesus challenged the way everyone thought. Like, like yes. that, that that's part of what we do as Christians. Christians, we are inherently radical compared to the rest of how the world thinks. And we should not be afraid of that. We, we should not be the... We, you don't need to be the cuddly, cuddly living room teddy bears. It's, it's okay to be lions and tigers. It's it's okay. You Not literally, to... but that's that's another story. Well, fair enough. If you want to dress up as them, I think it's a matter of Christian freedom. <laughs> that's right. You heard it here first, first, folks. Andrew is giving a biblical pass to furries. <laughs> but to get back on topic, what I'm saying is, I think especially saying that GJ, G, my word, GJ, you got me mixing up my all my initials, man. <laughs> so it's like a, a rapper <laughs> GJ GJ in the house <laughs> it's my favorite anime 
Um, <laughs> there was, like, was like five references in one. No, um, but G.K. Chesterton said that, you know, the, the life of a Christian does not have to be some dour-ordered, constant, you know, walking around. You know, when you were saved... You, you, know, you, you weren't saved. You, you weren't thrown in a cage to keep you away from the bad things. The bad things were thrown in a cage so that the good things can run wild. The good things can run amok. Let yourselves go run amok, Christians. Go. Get wild. Dare. Dream. Freak people out a little bit. So I think this comes to like how we we're going to approach our fiction. Like I I definitely would say would say that even among regular fiction, my, my fiction is definitely wild and unique and well I, I plan to be. Now I'm kind of bragging, but my approach is constantly called the John Skill the John Cooper Skillet approach. You know Skillet, right? I do, and I love I love the example you use for this. It's perfect. Oh yeah, so. John Cooper, he's um, a professing Christian in uh, really good theology too, um, pretty performed. But um, he, he does uh, the Christian metal band Skillet, and he doesn't think that everything ought to be Christian in his songs. Like they're not all about God, but he takes every opportunity in his interviews to talk about the gospel, to talk about God and stuff like that. And to me, I like that because like not like two of my major works are about Christianity. My second planned film. And uh, what Michael saw, which is a graphic novel mm -hmm. I'm working on, but one is like it, Black Swan and Red Dragon Kings. Like that's that's saying the conservatives. Like I'm, I don't mind it being secular. Like I, I like what what Skillet has done. Like has has come forth and, and shown an example to other believers. Yes, all truth is God's truth. Thank you, Augustine. So you think you're going to be something like that, like more of a John Skill in your approach, John I, Cooper? I, I, I think so, yeah. I mean, all, all my stories are written from a Christian perspective. Um, but they're not all necessarily about Christianity. No, they're, they're not all about Christianity because, you know, not everything needs to be an allegory. Just because C.S. Lewis and Jesus did it really well does not mean that the rest of us can do it as well or that the rest of us ought to do it in everything we write. I was... Yeah, like my, a lot of my stories about Christianity in the future, but it's real world Christianity, not an allegory. Sure, yeah, no, I, I was just thinking about like uh, there was there was a book, um, uh, I don't know if you were at, um, if you were part of the uh, epic read through of uh, the, the the there was there there was a gentleman who I, I saw as a speaker at a conference a while ago, and he, and he wrote a number of fantasy books. And I don't I don't want to give them ne negative attention because uh, and because the the, spe the speaker is genuinely a wonderful wonderful man. I think I know who you're speaking about. Yeah, but, go on. but um, the books. I mean, from a writing perspective, they are a disaster. It is it is. It's laughable. I, it, it's not. It's not. The, it's not. The, you know what they're saying is laughable. It's just that every everything is just such a thinly veiled allegory. It's not even thinly veiled. It's 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 a clumsy allegory. And so, even though like even though we may look sort of down on that from an art perspective, that that was still being used to accomplish a purpose. So while I think that we do need to look ahead we need to look higher we need to look towards you know making genuinely edifying art we need to look towards making art that lives up to our genuine creative potentials as we are sub creators we are endowed with god's creative spirit that that, that is what the spirit of god is that is how we are in his image rather mm -hmm. than you know we, we don't it's not because we look like god but even if people aren't as gifted, even if people are writing things that aren't as good, even if things are making things that people will meme at, even other Christians will laugh at because they are recognizable as being bad, we should also not be negative to those people because those people are out there for a reason too. So that, 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 is, that, is, that is my sort of caveat to our, towards our 
rather negative discussion. True. So, uh, do you want to finish up with our questions? Yes. Uh, right. I guess I'll go first. Go for it, my man. So, do you think that the best writers come from very northern, rich, big cities, if only because being cooped up inside a long time forces people to consume and make media more, and being in a big city gives people the resources to consume and make great media? Some examples were like Conan Brothers and Terry Gilliam from Minneapolis, Wachowski's from Chicago, Eastern German, Polish literature. And by the way, this is kind of more of a European thing because, like, the South was destroyed until like the 1960s mm. and the west coast wasn't much of a thing until recently but i see this more in, you know what i'm saying right i know i know what you're saying i think there's something to that i think we see that respected in like what for what sports are focused on and what hobbies are enjoyed so i think if it carried over to literature i think it would make sense though i'd say many of our sort of i mean i think you know we have obviously two very great writers from the south in recent memory I'd say we have Flannery O'Connor and um, Cormac McCarthy. Who adopted the South as a New Englander from Rhode Island, but definitely Southern. True. Um, maybe you would include, um, what's her name? Name currently escapes me, uh, Shirley Jackson. She was a Southerner, I believe. Um, maybe, maybe I, I would, I, I would say I could see that as a thing, probably sort of up until the internet age, maybe. Because the internet, <laughs> I- internet age is the great bringer of indoors. I see forced to go in indoors. So I see as myself a Philadelphian, like, it's so much watch list stuff done during, like, the winter months and Christmas break and all that, but not so much, not so much during summer when I wanted to be out and stuff. Yeah. Like, if I lived in Chicago, I didn't have any beach to go to in the summer, you know, like, I, I just might just watch something instead. Yeah. All right. My question is, uh, what Christian series would you save from itself if you had the ability to? I feel like the works of Ted Decker come to mind. Okay. Okay. Like he had some good ideas, but he seemed to squander it. Like he could, like you remember that like the red, blue, green thing he tried doing, like the yeah. quadrilogy or whatever. Yeah. They had like redeemable parts, but I just didn't like how it went. Like I like how he wrote the bat characters and like the fake Garden of Eden. Or whatever. Ted, t- t- Ted Decker. I have I have read some of Ted Decker, and I, I think it's always like there's always like good parts. Yes. There's 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 always definitely good parts. He's one of the, he's one of the better. He is one of the better. Yeah. Yeah. If I could use a film analogy, I think he's kind of more like M Night Shyamalan. Not the fact that he's he's focused on twists, but he's like very hit and miss. I think. Yeah. Like there's like certain elements, like you have some good ideas but you don't have a full happy meal there <laughs> yeah yeah it's, it's like, like it's like ted, ted decker most of ted decker's books are the village <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> it's like yeah that was good but it wasn't the whole happy meal i i love it so your second question is more than uh, 35 episodes into our podcast, what would you say is the main difference in our fiction, or at the very least, in our approach to slash philosophy of fiction? I think that our main approaches, I think ours are a little bit different in that... Hmm... I would say, like, for me, realism, but that's kind of, like, summing up too much. And we haven't written too, too much at this point either, but... Huh. Yeah. I, 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 I would say that maybe... I think that your fiction has gotten more real-world influence, if that makes hmm. sense. Yeah. And I think It's that... kind of interesting, because I kick a lot of influence from fiction, real fiction. In fiction fiction, you know? Yeah, and I think that my fiction has... Be, you know, I would say, I, would say I think my fiction has probably become a, bit, a lot more grounded. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's because it's come down a lot. It's the, it's the dragging it down from high fantasy to proper fantasy. I'll leave it there. I'll leave it there. I, I, I can have a long rant about my fantasy opinions and why, and why I think they're right. But it doesn't matter if I'm right. <laughs> wow. Yes. 
But I, I, I think that, you know, I think both of us have gotten much more of an appreciation for realism and groundedness. Yes. All right. And, and finally, me is uh, I was talking to, you know, that we that we as, you know, we among Christian artists, we do see a little bit of an unhealthy obsession with allegory. What part of the Bible would you like to be, see written as a novel allegory? Um, Genesis would be interesting just because, like, I've always, like, thought, I still think it, though, that, like, as much as, like, it's tempting to try to, like, think up a great theological system of theistic evolution, yeah. things keep on changing in terms of, like, the science, like, the science never settled, so, like, sort of like a, a full-length, like, old Earth, old universe reimagining of, like, genesis just to like try to see how that would work because i i have no way of seeing how that would work like death before the fall stuff like that like just an attempt at making it make sense that would be a, more of a novel ideas thing i guess but i don't know that would be very i i would definitely be into that there's a there's an interesting philosophy a book a book about that called origins with a man leaning against an o that's all i remember is it a novel or, or a research it's book? it's a research book uh, it's a, it's a, it's a philosophy textbook. I'm turning away from my microphone because we're professional. Uh, I don't remember who wrote it. It was written by a couple people. I think okay. one might have been a woman. I don't know what that has to do with it. I just, I just remember I just seem to remember that one of the names in the front was a lady, which is not all that common in philo in like Christian philosophy textbooks. I might have read something like that, but I'm not sure. I'm not, not quite sure. I'll send you a picture of it. There's like a thing in in, uh, in my school, actually written by some people for, at, from Messiah College, but I'll, tell you, I'll show it to you later. Cool. All right. So uh, I think this is us reaching the end of our podcast where we talk about Christianity, Christian fiction, education, North and South. Are we still fighting the Civil War? What do people do in their spare time? And what do Taoists really think about Baptists? <laughs> Here to answer all the big questions and a lot of the smaller ones. This is Behind the Curve signing off. I'm Matt. No, I'm not. I'm Andrew. I'm Matt. He's and Matt. This is Andrew. <laughs> yes. Have a good afternoon, evening. It's what time? It's Jesus late. Good night, everybody. <laughs>